Well, hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Apologetics Academy. My name is Jonathan McClanchy and I um, host this weekly uh, webinar where I bring on different speakers, scholars, authorities, experts from across the theological and philosophical spectrum to present on topics of interest to Christians, particularly those which bear on the question of whether or not Christianity is true. And we also cross-examine and evaluate other worldviews as well, including atheism, Islam, Mormonism, um, and many others. Um, there's a number of ways you can participate in today's program. Um, after uh, the course of my uh, presentation uh, today, you can uh, submit a question by hitting the Q&A button, which is at the top of your screen, and submitting a question that way. Um, you can submit it anonymously if you wish, just check the anonymous button when submitting it. You can also uh, click the raise hand button at the um, uh, top of your screen and at the appropriate time I'll promote you to be a co-panelist and you'll have opportunity to interact and engage that way. And there's also a chat box um, that you, which you can participate in. Please, if you're doing so, direct your chat to everyone rather than just uh, panelists. That would be great. Um, so um, you might recall that a uh, um, few, uh, um, couple, uh, two or three months ago, I presented a webinar on the subject of undesigned coincidences in the scriptures, an argument of their veracity. And um, I presented a number of lines of evidence um, to substantiate the counts uh, contained in the Gospels and Acts and also substantiating the Pauline authorship of certain epistles traditionally attributed to Paul. Um, in this presentation, I want to develop um, on that argument uh, further and um, make a case that uh, there are even further reasons to develop, uh, to, to, to trust the New Testament. So we're going to be looking at some even uh, further reasons to trust the gospel accounts of Jesus' life in particular. So uh, let's uh, first go to uh, one of the world's leading uh, authorities on the Bible, or, or not, uh, Richard Dawkins of University of Oxford, who is um, very uh, well known for his 2006 best-selling book, The God Delusion. And in The God Delusion, he writes that the Gospels are not reliable accounts of what happened in the history of the real world. All were written long after the death of Jesus and also after the epistles of Paul, which mention almost none of the alleged facts of Jesus' life. He moreover uh, goes on to write, nobody knows who the four evangelists were, but they almost certainly never met Jesus personally. So um, I want to begin by um, examining this claim to see, um, can we actually make a case for who did write the gospels? Well, there are two questions for evaluating the veracity of the New Testament. Um, the first is, do we have an accurate copy of the original New Testament documents? And the second is, do the original New Testament documents tell the truth, right? You can have a perfect copy of something which is incorrect um, or not um, historically true. Um, and so for the sake of time, I'm not going to address the first of these questions. Uh, so I'm just going to skip ahead and straight to the conclusion, which is yes, we do have an accurate copy of the original New Testament documents. And um, I'm moreover, um, in, in this presentation, going to argue that the original New Testament documents, uh, which are well-preserved, uh, do indeed tell um, true things about the life of Jesus. So here we see um, a timeline right from the cross of Jesus Christ, which happened uh, approximately 30 or 33 AD, depending on which scholar you talk to, and culminating in the destruction of the Jewish temple which um, took place in AD 70 under Titus, the son of the Emperor Vespasian. And um, the Apostle Paul um, is thought to have been beheaded in the mid 60s AD during the persecution under the Emperor Nero. Uh, there was a great fire that broke out in Rome in AD 64, and according to Primus Tacitus, and basically um, the Emperor Nero uh, was receiving a blame that, he, that the the fire was the result of an order, and so he then fastened the guilt, Tacitus tells us, upon the Christians and unleashed a very terrible persecution on them. So Paul um, um, died under the, under the um, Emperor Nero during the mid-60s AD. James, a brother of Jesus, um, we also have good reason to believe, died during the 60s AD. 
The Book of Acts uh, was probably written around 61, 62 AD, somewhere around there. Um, there's a good reason to think that, for one thing, uh, it finishes with Paul being placed under house arrest. Um, it ends on a kind of cliffhanger. It doesn't mention the death of Paul or the death of Peter or the death of James, the brother of Jesus, or the great fire in Roman AD 64, or the persecution that ensued under the Emperor Nero, or the siege of Jerusalem between 66 and 70, or the destruction of the temple indeed in AD 70, all of which you would expect to be in there had they occurred by the time of uh, um, the, um, the writing of the Book of Acts. <clears throat> the Book of First Corinthians, the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, um, is usually dated to around AD 55, the mid 50s AD. Um, it's thought that First Corinthians was written from Ephesus. Uh, Paul, um, af um, after visiting Corinth, uh, he gets acquainted with Priscilla and Aquila, and then he travels as far as he travels to Ephesus, and Priscilla and Aquila accompany him as far as Ephesus, and um, and then uh, he departs from their company. But when he writes to the Corinthian Christians, he sends greetings from Priscilla and Aquila, indicating he's writing that epistle to Corinth from Ephesus. And we have a pretty good idea of when he was in Corinth, because um, Acts chapter 18 mentions that um, Achaia, the proconsul of Achaia, uh, the, um, the Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, was present in Corinth. We know that he was present in Corinth between uh, 51 and 52 AD. And so the uh, first epistle to the Corinthians must occur shortly thereafter. First Corinthians chapter 15 also contains a creedal tradition of the beliefs of the early church. Um, it, um, it, what I, Paul writes, what I received I pass on to you is of first importance that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that um, he rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, and the um, 12 and to more than 500 of the brothers at um, the same time was supposed to live in some fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one and timely born. Uh, most scholars think that that's an early creedal tradition of the beliefs of the early church. Uh, there's a number of good reasons to think that. It's rhythmic in style. It's designed for easy memorization. It uses the Aramaic name Cephas or Peter, which is an early name for Peter. It, um, it's easily translated from Greek back into Aramaic, suggesting its Aramaic origin. Um, Paul likely received that cradle tradition upon his visit to Jerusalem three years after his conversion, as recounted in Galatians 1, where he meets with Peter and James, the very people mentioned in that creed. Um, so if Acts is written around the early 60s AD, then Luke must predate Acts, because Acts is a sequel to the, the Gospel of Luke. And so Luke has to be even earlier still. Moreover, um, the Gospel of Luke is quoted from in uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, for the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it's treading at the grain, and the worker deserves his wages, the second quotation coming um, verbatim from Luke. Um, and he talks about it as scripture, suggesting that um, he's actually quoting from, from the Gospel of Luke. And uh, I would argue that the pastorals are indeed Pauline in authorship, and I'm very happy to discuss those in the Q&A if people want. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 11 also arguably um, quotes from Luke, or at least source material also underlying Luke in connection with the Lord's Supper. So, um, and Luke is largely believed to be the latest of, this, of the synoptic Gospels to be written, indicating that um, Mark, the first of the Gospels uh, to be written, had to be even earlier still. Um, so, um, Now, Paul, if he died in the um, mid-60s AD, then, um, then his letters, of course, had to be written before he died. Um, and so uh, there we have Romans, 2 Corinthians, and Galatians, which were among the undisputed works of Paul. Um, they had to be written before he died, so they also are before um, that date. And um, most of the, or all of the New Testament, I would submit to you, had to be composed um, by AD 70 because there's not a whiff of the destruction of the temple um, among the New Testament documents. In fact, even in John's Gospel, which is usually dated to around AD 90 or thereabouts, um, in John chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Now there are colonies by the sheep gate at Solomon's Pool of Bethesda. Now those um, colonies, along with the rest of the temple complex, of course, were destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. And so that might suggest that even John's gospel predates AD 70. That's an argument 
that has been advanced by Dr. Daniel Wallace. Now, I want you to notice that this is, um, of course, the age of the eyewitnesses. So we have very early sources concerning the life of Jesus. Now, let's um, move beyond uh, the issue of dating to who wrote the Gospels. Well, Dr. Bar Ehrman is a very well-known um, critic of the New Testament. He wrote a book um, called uh, Jesus Interrupted um, in 2011, and um, he writes some books, such as the Gospels, have been written anonymously, only later to be ascribed to certain authors who probably did not write them, apostles and friends of the apostles. But um, this is um, claim actually um, bear up. Well, let's have a look at some of the early attestation of authorship. Um, these are some of the um, writers in the early church who attest to the authorship of the Gospels. We'll discuss them in more detail shortly. Tertullian of Carthage, writing um, in the very early um, third century. Clement of Alexandria, writing towards the end of the first of the second century. Irenaeus of Lyon, writing um, um, in about 180 AD. Uh, the Muratorian Fragment, which is the earliest uh, canonical list, which contains about 22 or 23 of the books of the New Testament, dating to around 170 AD. Justin Martyr, who wrote around 150 AD. And Papias of Hierapolis, who wrote about, uh, around 125 AD. Papias' works have all been lost, but we have uh, preserved quotations um, in other early church writings. Now, I want you to notice the geographical spread of the attestation that the Gospels enjoy as to their authorship. We have Irenaeus um, up in Lyon in France. You, we have Tertullian in Carthage in North Africa. We have Clement in Alexandria in Egypt. And we have Papias in Hierapolis in Asia Minor in modern day Turkey. So we have a very wide geographical spread of attestation. And what's interesting is that in the, um, in the early second century, you have the Gospels often being quoted, but without names being attached to them, suggesting that the, um, the authors um, understood their audience to understand these documents to be authoritative. Um, and then uh, in uh, it, the, the Old Testament, of course, is, oft, is also quoted without names necessarily always being attached to it. Then in the mid to late second century, when we see finally names being attached to these documents, we see anonymity and we see wide geographical spread, suggesting very early tradition and a very monolithic tradition supporting the um, authorship of the Gospels. But there's more. Let's have a look at the authorship of Mark's Gospel. Now, um, Justin Martyr tells us that the Apostles themselves composed memoirs, which are called Gospels. That's from his first Apology, chapter 66. In chapter 106 of his Dialogue with Trifo, which is dated to around 160 AD, he writes, and I quote, and when it is said that he changed the name of one of the apostles to Peter, and when it is written in the memoirs of him that this so happened, as well as that he changed the names of other two brothers, the sons of Zebedee, to Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Um, now, what's interesting is that um, neither of these, um, occur, th these instances occurs in the so-called, um, or the excellent fragment we have of the so-called Gospel of Peter. Um, but both of those um, instances, uh, the changing of Simon's name to Peter and the changing of the names of, or, or the, the naming of the sons of Zebedee, but energy is meaning sons of thunder. Neither of these occurs in the so-called Gospel of Peter or the fragment we have of it. Both of them, however, are in the Gospel of Mark. And the sons of Zebedee incident is only found in Mark, suggesting that he's actually talking here about the Gospel of Mark. But he, he identifies it as the memoirs of the apostle Peter which is um, very fascinating, and that will make sense um, in due course. Now, Tertullian of Carthage, um, in uh, his, again, his Marcion, uh, tells us that that which Mark published may be affirmed to be Peter's, whose interpreter Mark was. And so, according to Tertullian, Mark re um, received um, the eyewitness testimony of Peter, and that um, was responsible for his, for his gospel. Irenaeus of Lyon, in his Against Heresies, who himself was a disciple of Polycarp, a companion of the Apostles, tells us that Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, did also hand down to us in writing what had been preached by Peter. So again, um, attesting that Mark's gospel is based upon the eyewitness testimony of the Apostle Peter. Clement of Alexandria, as quoted by Eusebius in his Ecclesiastical History, 
tells us that those who heard Peter's preaching were not satisfied with merely a single hearing or with the unwritten teaching of the divine gospel, but with all sorts of entreaties, they besought Mark, who was a follower of Peter, and whose gospel is extant, to leave behind with them in writing a record of the teaching passed on to them orally. Papus of Hierapolis, um, according to Eusebius, tells us that Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, though not indeed in order, whatsoever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ. Now Mark, I would suggest, is an unlikely choice for a false attribution of authorship. Um, the, um, the apocryphal forgeries in the second and third centuries routinely attribute their gospels to high profile figures, such as Peter, James, Thomas. John Mark is best known for having caused a sharp fallout between Paul and Barnabas over having withdrawn from them during a mission trip in Pamphylia. Um, and so since the early church believed Mark's gospel to convey the teachings of Peter, it seems likely that it would have been attributed to Peter had the early church not felt constrained by the fact that Mark really did write the gospel that bears his name. Indeed, if Justin Martyr identified Mark's gospel as the memoirs of Peter, it seems very unlikely that it would have gone from the memoirs of Peter to the gospel of Mark, unless there was very good reason to attribute it to Mark. So I think we have good reason to think that Mark is indeed the author of Mark's gospel. Let's though, look at some of the internal evidence bearing on, uh, on this. Uh, Richard Balcom, who you can see um, pictured on the right, is um, a very famous British uh, New Testament scholar. Uh, he is at the University of Cambridge. I uh, used to be at the University of St. Andrews. And um, he wrote a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. And he argues that, the, uh, that there's certain internal indicators for Peter's influence on Mark's gospel. Um, and I've, I'm going to mention a few of those here. The frequent mention of Peter in Mark's gospel is one of those. Mark refers to Peter a total of 26 times, whereas Matthew mentions Peter only three additional times, despite the fact that Matthew's gospel is about double the length of Mark's gospel. Mark is the only gospel author who does not use Simon Peter when talking about Peter, instead using either as Simon or Peter. Simon was a very common name in Palestine, but Mark does not distinguish him from other Simons, which suggests uh, familiarity. And Mark's gospel also is bookended with the disciple Peter. He's the first and last disciple to be mentioned, which is a phenomenon that has been attributed in other ancient texts where a source is attributed to a particular eyewitness. Having looked at the Gospel of Mark then, now let's turn our attention to the authorship of John's Gospel. Let's first look at some of the internal indicators of Johannine authorship. Here's a text from John chapter 18, verse 10. Um, this is um, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and then the soldiers and the chief priests and Judas Iscariot come to arrest Jesus. And we read that Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, what's curious about this detail is that John is the only gospel author to mention the name of the high priest's servant. None of the other gospel authors tell us this detail. How does John know the servant's name? Then we continue reading in the same chapter. We get to verses 26 and 27. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Again, there's another question. How does the author know that the individual who approached Peter was one of the high priest's servants? Um, we can look at um, in, in verses 15 and 16 for the answer. Um, so, uh, or we can look at uh, verses 15 and 16. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Okay, since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So, um, here we have um, this other disciple, along with Simon Peter, who's followed Jesus. And because he knows um, the because he's known to the high priest, 
he's allowed into the courtyard. Um, so who is this other disciple who is known to the high priest? Well, if we look at John chapter 20, verses uh, 2 and 3, it says, So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. There's that phrase again. The one whom Jesus loved and said to them, Take, uh, they, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. So here we have the other disciple here uh, identified as none other than the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, which I think one can make a good case for is, is um, John, the son of Zebedee. Um, now, when Jesus saw it, um, so, um, in John chapter 19, verse 26, moreover, we read, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. So um, this is one of the, in, the disciples, evidently, who has followed Jesus as far as the cross. And we read earlier in, in chapter 18 of John, that two disciples followed Jesus. One was Peter and one was this other disciple. Um, and here we have this other disciple identified as the disciple whom he loved. Now, who wrote John's gospel according to John, according to the author himself? John chapter 21, verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, speaking of the beloved disciple, and it was written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And so John self-identifies as a disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, and so that explains then or illuminates how he came to know the name of the high priest's servant. Oh, because he was known to the high priest. Um, let's look at some of the external evidence for Jahani authorship of John's gospel. Tertullian of Carthage in his Against Marcion, um, Book 4, Chapter 2, tells us that of the apostles, therefore, John and Matthew first instill faith into us, whilst of apostolic men Luke and Mark uh, renew it afterwards. Irenaeus of Lyon tells us that John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. And Irenaeus also frequently quotes from John's gospel by name. John is probably the, uh, Irenaeus is probably the strongest uh, of the uh, attestations to Johannine authorship of John because Irenaeus, by his own confession, was a disciple of Polycarp of Smyrna, and Polycarp of Smyrna was himself a disciple of John the Apostle. Um, and so you've got this unbroken chain of custody, if you will, from John to Polycarp to Irenaeus. Clement of Alexandria, um, in his still extant writings, makes several mentions of the Gospel according to John and quotes out of it. Craig Keener, who's a very famous New Testament scholar, uh, says, Cons consonant with what we find from the internal evidence, church tradition identifies the author of the fourth gospel with the Apostle John. D.A. Carson, um, in his The Gospel According to John, he writes, we have already traced the principal external evidence, i.e. evidence outside the fourth gospel itself, that maintains the evangelist was none other than the Apostle John, son of Zebedee. That evidence, such as it is, is virtually unanimous. Even if Irenaeus, towards the end of the second century, is amongst the strongest, totally unambiguous witness, witnesses, his um, personal connection with Polycarp, who knew John, means the distance in terms of personal memories is not very great. Even Dodd, who discounts the view that the Apostle John wrote the fourth gospel, considers the external evidence formidable, adding, of any external evidence to the contrary that could be called cogent, I am not aware. Now let's come to the Gospel of Luke. Now the authorship of Luke's Gospel is attested by Clement of Alexandria, by Tertullian of Carthage, and by Irenaeus of Lyon. As for the internal evidence, um, Luke and Acts are clearly written by the same author. Um, there's also good evidence from the we passages in Acts 16 and following that the author was a companion of the Apostle Paul. Um, and Paul tells us that Luke was a traveling companion in his letters in Colossians 4.14, in 2 Timothy 4.11, and Philemon 1.24. And uh, yes, um, Colossians and 2 Timothy are written by Paul, and, uh, and I'm very happy to defend those in the Q&A if anyone would like. And Philemon is one of the undisputed works of Paul. If Acts uh, comes from a, a meticulous historian who seems to have first-hand knowledge of at least some of the life and doings of Paul, this fact should increase the credibility of Luke. 
Um, and um, we also have attention to medical details in Luke's gospel. Um, so Colossians 4.14, Paul writes, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you. Um, so we learn from Paul's letter to the Colossians that uh, Luke was a physician or medical doctor. In Luke's description of miraculous cures, he pays particular attention to medical details, which the other Gospels do not. For example, while the other Gospels simply speak of Christ as healing a leper and of curing a man who had a withered hand, Luke says the former was full of leprosy, and it was the right hand of the latter which was withered, specifying the right hand. The other Gospels say Peter's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, but Luke writes that she was taken with a high fever. And the account of the healing of the um, centurion's servant, Matthew simply says the servant was sick with a fever, but Luke, with more fullness, records that he was sick and at the point of death. He is the only author to mention that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In reporting Peter's cutting off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Luke is the only writer to mention that Jesus touched his ear and healed him. So um, having looked at uh, the authorship of um, John, uh, Mark, and Luke, now let's come to the Gospel of Matthew. What about the external witnesses? According to Clement of Alexandria, Matthew and Luke were published first, um, and they are the Gospels containing the genealogies. Irenaeus tells us that Matthew's Gospel was the first one written, and it was originally written in the Hebrew dialect. Papias tells us that Matthew wrote the oracles of the Lord in Aramaic. Um, given that Matthew was a tax collector who was seen by the Jews as being traitors, Matthew seems like a surprising choice for a false attribution of authorship. Uh, we also have internal evidence to um, Matthew's authorship of his gospel. Matthew alone, for instance, records the circumstance of Jesus paying tribute to the tax collector of Capernaum in chapter 17. Both um, Mark and Luke, in naming the disciples, say Matthew and Thomas, with Matthew's name being first in both stories. Matthew himself says Thomas and Matthew, adding the tax collector, uh, which no other Gospels mention. So he switches the order, so he puts himself last, um, and he adds the, the, the publican or the tax collector. Um, in Luke chapter 5, verse 29, we read, and Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a great company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. So the, the, this um, feast or this dinner that um, is being spoken of here is uh, kind of Levi's or, or Matthew's uh, leaving party from being a tax collector. Um, so all the tax collectors are joining and Jesus is eating with them. In Matthew's account of the same uh, story, he omits the reference to himself and the magnitude of the feast, saying, And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were, and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Here's some more internal evidence. Um, Matthew 14, verses 1 and 2. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, this raises two questions. Number one, why is Herod talking about this matter to his servants? And secondly, how would Matthew know what Herod had said to his servants? Well, the solution is given over in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, in which we read, Soon afterward, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, provided for them out of their means. So this um, explains how uh, uh, the author of Matthew could come to know what Herod had said to his servants in Matthew chapter 14 and also connects Matthew's Gospel with apostolic testimony. Let's look at the early use of the Gospels in Acts. Um, so you might have heard of the apocryphal Gospels, the apocryphal forgeries of the second and third centuries. Um, here, there's a list of um, the canonical Gospels in Acts, um, and a list of a selection from the apocryphal Gospels. Um, and then on, um, at the, on the 
top, we can see the different early church um, figures, Ignatius, Polycarp, the red ones of the heretics, Marcion and Valentinus, uh, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement, Tertullian, Muratorian, Canon, Oregon, and so on. Um, and if, if the early church father um, mentions the book uh, favorably, they have a tick. If they don't mention it, they get a dot. And if they mention it disfavorably, they get an, an X or a cross. And as you can see, uh, the canonical gospels were very quickly regarded as, as carrying apostolic authority. The apocryphal forgeries didn't really have any acceptance at all. Um, okay, let's look at uh, some more evidence um, that connects the Gospels to the testimony of eyewitnesses. Here I'm going to discuss the, the test of personal names in the Gospels. This is um, also an argument that was developed by Richard Balcom, University of Cambridge scholar, in his book Jesus and the Eyewitnesses of the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. It's a, um, in one of the arguments that he develops in this book um, is an argument based upon Jewish personal names. It's based on a study of 3,000 names. Um, and what's interesting is that the Palestinian Jewish names are different from the, the um, Jewish names elsewhere, like in Egypt, for instance. And what Bauckham finds is that the Gospels and Acts accurately reflects the naming patterns of Palestine. Um, and so these... Uh, these um, this study of 3,000 names, these names are coming from documentary sources, ossuaries, and so on. Um, what's interesting is that um, if we look at uh, um, the top two, name, top two men's names, um, which are Simon and Joseph, first century Israel, 15.6%. In the Gospels and Acts, 18.2%. Okay, let's go to a bigger data sample. Top nine men's names. For century Israel, 41.5%. Gospels and Acts, 40.3%. What about the top two women's names, Mary and Salom? For century Israel, 28.6%. In um, Gospels and Acts, 38.9%. Um, bigger data sample, the top nine women's names, 49.7%. And inside the Gospels and Acts, we have 61.1%. So you see this, uh, uh, the, uh, the naming patterns of the Gospels and Acts uh, resembles the naming um, patterns of first century Israel. And what's interesting is that the naming frequencies in uh, the, of Jewish names in Palestine are different from the naming frequencies of Jewish names outside, such as in Egypt, for instance. So here we can see the rank um, um, outside the New Testament, um, together with the number of New Testament individuals for the top six names. Now contrast the rank in e ranks in Egypt with the ranks in Palestine. So Eliezer is number one in Egypt. It's number three in Palestine. Uh, Sabathius is number two in Egypt, but only 68th equal in Palestine. Joseph is number three, um, number two in Palestine. So Scythius is fourth equal in Egypt, but number 16 in Palestine. Pappas is fourth equal in Egypt, but 39th equal in Palestine. Uh, Ptolemaeus is sixth equal in Egypt, but 50th equal in Palestine. And Samuel is sixth equal in Egypt, but um, 22nd in Palestine. And so we can see that, uh, there, that the, there's, a very, there's a lot of disparity in terms of the naming frequencies in Egypt versus Palestine. So what this naming pattern suggests strongly is that the Gospels are written by someone in close proximity to the time and place of the events that they're narrating. And even if you are someone in close proximity to the time um, and place of the events you're narrating, your intuition about the relative naming frequencies is unlikely to be um, um, an accurate reflection of the actual naming frequencies. If I was to, um, I mean, this remember this is the days before Google and Wikipedia and the internet and where people actually took records of such things. Um, and so the fact that the, that the Gospels actually get this pattern correct um, suggests verisimilitude that is actually, um, it resembles, um, has a ring of truth. Um, here's um, an interesting um, pattern that we find um, throughout the Gospels where we have, uh, uh, this is a, a pattern that, that, um, that is found uh, throughout um, 
all four gospels for if we have a high frequency name then it is distinguished with a qualifier or you might say a disambiguator to distinguish the individual from other people by the same name whereas low frequency names don't have a qualifier so here's an example from matthew chapter 10 where we have the naming of the 12 apostles it says the names of the 12 apostles are these first simon high ranking qualifier called peter and andrew is a low ranking name but he's identified in relation to his brother and his brother and uh, james high ranking name this uh, qualifier the son of zebedee and john a high ranking name his brother Philip, low-ranking name, no qualifier, and Bartholomew, low-ranking name, no qualifier. Thomas is not even in the top 99 names and no qualifier. And Matthew, high-ranking name, qualifier, the tax collector. James, high-ranking name, qualifier, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus, low-ranking name, no qualifier. Simon, high-ranking name, qualifier, the Canaanian. And Judas, high-ranking name, Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So... Um, here again, we see that the author is closely acquainted with the relative naming frequencies in first century Palestine. What's also interesting is that we see uh, the in quoted speech this pattern borne out, but not in the when the narrator is speaking, because it can be assumed that the reader understands which individual we're talking about. So, for example, in relation to John the Baptist. It says in Matthew chapter 14, Herod said to his servants, this is John the Baptist, a qualifier. But then the narrator speaking, Herod sees John, no qualifier. John says, no qualifier. Then we've got quoted speech again. Herodias' daughter, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist, qualifier. You don't want to get the head of the wrong John. Then it says he said it beheaded John. No qualifier. So um, let's contrast that then with the um, naming patterns in the second century apographical gospels. So the gospel of Thomas, for example, the individual's name there, so Didymus Judas Thomas, which just means twin Judas twin, which is rather strange. James the Just, Simon Peter. Uh, we have Jesus, Matthew, Thomas, Mary, and Salome. That's it for the gospel of Thomas. What about the gospel of Mary? We have uh, the savior, we have Peter, Mary, Andrew, Levi, that's it. Gospel of Judas. We have Judas Iscariot, funnily enough, and we have Jesus. And that's all we have. And then we also have lots of heavenly figures who seem to come from outer space, um, as shown there. So the conclusion then, in regards to the names, the Gospels have exactly the pattern of names we, we could expect them to have if they are true. The pattern, I would suggest, is too complex for an ancient forger to reproduce. So let's move on then um, to bring up some further arguments supporting my case here. Let's talk about the criterion of embarrassment. According, in the criterion of embarrassment is a criterion that historians use um, when evaluating um, historical documents. Um, if the narrative contains um, events or stories or narrations which are embarrassing or awkward to the author or authors, it probably happened because you don't make up things to make yourself look bad. The disciples in the Gospels are portrayed as dim-witted. They fail to understand what Jesus is saying on numerous occasions. They are portrayed as uncaring. They fall asleep on Jesus not once, but twice during his greatest hour of need. They make no effort to give Jesus a proper burial. They are rebuked. Peter is even called Satan by Jesus. And um, that's particularly um, significant because it marks Gospel is supposed to be based upon the eyewitness testimony of the Apostle Peter. And so it's particularly unlikely that you would find that in Mark's Gospel had that not actually happened. Paul rebukes Peter for being wrong about a theological issue in Galatians 2.11. The disciples are portrayed as cowards. Peter denies Christ three times to save his own skin. The disciples run away. The women are the brave ones. They're the primary witnesses to the empty tomb. Whereas in patriarchal society of ancient Palestine, the testimony of a woman was not highly regarded. Um, their testimony was worth the equivalent to that of a man. So why would you make women as the primary witnesses to the empty tomb? The disciples are also doubters. Um, despite being taught several times that Jesus would rise from the dead, the disciples are doubtful when they hear of the resurrection, and some are even doubtful after they see him risen. Thomas, for instance. Um, now, Jesus himself is, um, also has many embarrassing facts recorded in the Gospels. He's considered out of his mind by his own family who come to seize him to take him home. 
he's deserted by many of his followers. Um, remember when he speaks about uh, um, his about uh, people having to eat his flesh and drink his blood, otherwise they have no life in them. And so many of his own followers leave at that point because that must have been considered grotesque teaching on his part, especially to a Jewish audience. He's not believed in by his own brothers, which would be very um, embarrassing for a rabbi. He's thought to be a deceiver. He turns off Jewish believers to the point that they want to stone him. He's called a madman. He's called a drunkard. He's called demon-possessed. He has his feet with the hair of a prostitute, which could easily have been seen as a sexual advance. Um, he's ignorant of the date of his uh, return in Mark 13, 32 and Matthew 24, 36. Um, he's crucified despite the fact that anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. In Deuteronomy 21, 23, uh, that's what we read. And in fact, um, the crucifixion of Jesus was an item of mockery among uh, both the Romans and the Jews. In fact, there's graffiti that was discovered in Rome where a man is depicted as um, staring and worshipping in adoration a crucified donkey. And the caption is, Alexandra has worshipped his God. Um, Justin Martyr in the second century had a, a dialogue with a Jewish philosopher by the name of Trifo. And Trifo said to Justin Martyr, these and such scriptures, sir, compel us to wait for he who is son of man shall receive from the ancient of days the everlasting kingdom. But this so-called Christ of yours was dishonorable and glorious, so much so that the last curse contained in the law of God fell on him, for he was crucified. So it seems very unlikely that the early Christians would have invented the crucifixion had it not happened. Indeed, the Jews had no belief in a dying Messiah. Um, the Messiah was supposed to be a, um, a, a conquering leader who would... Um, overthrow the Roman occupiers and reestablish a Davidic reign, not suffer the shameful and embarrassing death of a criminal. Now let's consider the principle of restraint. And the principle of restraint um, is, um, I'll give you some examples, not once did Jesus address many of the major topics of controversy and debate in the early church, including whether believers had to be circumcised, how to regulate speaking in tongues, what rules were open to women in ministry. Um, so these were hot potato topics in the early church, and you would expect if the early gospel authors had felt themselves at liberty to manufacture sayings and falsely attribute them to Jesus, then you would expect him to address some of these hot button topics, but he doesn't. Um, moreover, none of the gospels give any details about the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus to Peter or the appearance to Jesus' brother James. Brief mention of the appearance to Peter, the individual appearance, that is, to Peter, is made in Luke 24, 33 to 34. Um, it says, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Um, the appearance to Peter is also alluded to in 1 Corinthians 15, 5, where it just mentions that he appeared to Cephas. Um, and the appearance uh, to James is mentioned only in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. Um, presumably, Peter and James both made it known that they had seen the Lord after the resurrection, but neither made an account of this private meeting available for publication. And that's something you would expect in an historical report rather than in um, fiction or something that's not true. Now let's come to the argument from unexplained illusions. Um, in So... Often we find in the Gospels uh, illusions which completely are unexplained and we don't, uh, we're not given any further explanation. And that's also a kind of pattern that we expect in history rather than something that's, that's just being made up. So in Mark chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, And Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is sons of thunder. There's no explanation given as to why James and John, the sons of Zebedee, are called sons of thunder. Absolutely no explanation given. Um, and so this, um, again, has verisimilitude as a ring of authenticity. Here's another example from Mark chapter 15, verse 21. They compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. Now, there's no explanation given in the Gospels as to who Alexander or Rufus were. Um, and it's, it's, it's probable, very, it is, it's very likely that, uh, that Alexander and Rufus were individuals known to the original audience. Um, and uh, they could, of course, go in and interview Alexander and Rufus to check, you know, uh, with Simon of Cyrene, their, their uh, father, the one who was compelled to carry the cross uh, for Jesus. 
Uh, but the fact that we have this unexplained illusion again, again, has verisimilitude, it has a ring of authenticity to it. Here's an example in Acts, Acts chapter 18, verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Canker, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. What's that about? We, there's no explanation given, no further discussion of him having cut his hair because he was under a vow. Um, and so it's just this unexplained detail, this unexplained illusion again, which is very surprising if, if this is not a work of history. Another pattern that we find is um, called the uniformity of expressive silence. Now, you might recall if you listened to my or viewed my Undesigned Coincidences presentation, I discussed this in relation to an example in Genesis 24, um, which concerned uh, Abraham sending his servant into Mesopotamia in search of a wife for his son Isaac and um, coming across Rebecca. And um, I discussed uh, this, prin this principle of the uniformity of expressive silence in relation to her father, Bethuel. Here I'm going to give an example in the New Testament. Now, what is the uniformity of expressive silence? Well, it's a form of undesignedness that can sometimes arise when we examine cases where information is assumed by the author, although not explicitly spelled out. Um, so it's basically repeated omissions that have a meaning. Let me give an example from the New Testament. Jesus' father, Joseph, appears only in the childhood narratives in Matthew and Luke. He is also briefly alluded to in John 1.45. We, uh, where it says, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And in John 6, 42, they said, it's not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, his father and mother we know. How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? The last we see of Joseph is during the trip to Jerusalem when Jesus is 12 years old, as recounted in Luke chapter 2. Nowhere are we told what happened to Joseph. There is a silent presumption of his death without any positive affirmation of that fact. What's more intriguing and more striking is that um, Joseph is conspicuously absent even while um, uh, Joseph, even while Jesus' mother and brothers are conspicuously present. So in Mark chapter three, for example, here's what we read. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my brother, mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And so, again, Joseph is conspicuously absent, even while Jesus' mother and brothers are conspicuously present in the scene. Mark chapter 6, the first six verses, another example. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, and what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So here again, we see Jesus' family conspicuously present but Joseph conspicuously absent. John chapter two, verse 12. Um, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Again, Joseph is missing. And then uh, perhaps most striking in John chapter 19, verse 27, on the cross, Jesus entrusts the care of his mother, Mary, to the beloved disciple, saying, Behold your mother, and it says, from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Now, why doesn't, what, where's Joseph in this scene? Why isn't Joseph taking care of Mary? Well, presumably he's dead, but, or, or perhaps he's a leper or something. We don't really know for sure. 
but the but this principle, this uniformity of expressive silence, suggests that the author knows something more than he actually discloses in his gospel account. Um, and so that again um, is a mark of verisimilitude, a mark of truth, rather than fiction. Um, and then again, also in the book of Acts, we read this account in Acts chapter one. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So again, Joseph is conspicuously absent from the scene. So let's look at some more evidence for the substantial veracity of the Gospels. Here I'm going to take a few of the objections to the Gospels, and I'm going to turn tables on them to use them as arguments for the veracity of the Gospels. So here's an example. This is from Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Now, we have a problem here. The objection is, why would anyone go north in order to go south, right? Look at the map again. See? So he, so he returns from the region of Tyre and goes through Sidon. Where you can see that labeled on the map. You have to go north, but he's on the, um, um, but he's, he's on the way south. So why would, he, uh, why, why would he have to go north in order to go south? Some critical scholars argue that this shows the evangelist was not directly acquainted with Palestine. One possible reply, of course, is that perhaps Jesus just had a specific reason for wanting to visit Sidon before going back to Galilee. Um, the narrative doesn't tell us. That would be a fair response, but I think we can do better than that. Let's look at the map again. There is a mountain, which I've marked on the map, called Mount Meron, which is three quarters of a mile high, directly between Tyre and the Sea of Galilee. And there's a pass from Sidon through the mountains to the Jordan River Valley where food travelers to Galilee could have fresh water for the journey, which you can also see on the map. And so then um, what we thought, what people thought was an objection to the gospels actually turns out to be an argument for it because it shows just how familiar and acquainted the author is with the geography and topography of the region. Let's look at another example. This is from Bart Ehrman's book, Jesus Interrupted, published in 2010. Um, Mark chapter seven, verse three indicates that he writes, Mark seven, three indicates that the Pharisees and all the Jews washed their hands before eating so as to observe the tradition of the elders. This is not true. Most Jews did not um, engage in this ritual. Now, where is, what is the evidence that Mark is wrong? Well, in Exodus um, 30, in Exodus 40, in Leviticus 20, the priests are called to observe hand-washing practices, but the people in general are not. But did the Jews of Jesus' time, who were heavily influenced by the Pharisees, engage in the practice, even though the written law did not require it of them? Well, let's look at some of the Jewish evidence um, this is from a le um, from letter of Aristeas, uh, written around 200 BC. And as, as is the custom of all the Jews, they washed their hands in the sea and prayed to God. Here's Philo of Alexandria. The law does not look upon those who have even touched a dead body, which is met with a natural death, as pure and clean, until they have washed and purified themselves with sprinklings and ablutions. Um... Here's a modern scholarly opinion from um, Susan Haber's book, They Shall Purify Themselves. Um, she writes, the centrality of impurity to Jewish life in the Second Temple period is supported by archeological evidence. The discovery of mikvaot in such diverse places as Gamla, Sepphoris, Herodium, and Masada suggests that in Palestine, the removal of impurity was not a right reserved only for approaching the sacred precincts of the temple, but was common practice for Jews of all walks of life. The textual evidence suggests that the Jews of the, of the diaspora also purify themselves, if not through immersion, then by sprinkling, splashing, or hand washing. Um, 
Here's another objection. This is from Mark chapter 10. Jesus says, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, here's the problem. Jewish law made provision for a man to divorce his wife, Deuteronomy 24, but not for a woman to divorce her husband. So as Mark blundered here, or maybe he's a Gentile who's just trying to adapt Jesus' teachings to, to suit a Gentile audience. Was he a Gentile who just betrays his ignorance of Jewish law? Or maybe he's deliberately changing it to make it relevant for a Roman audience. Okay, let's let's um here's a go to let's go to a critic to have a statement of the objection. This is from uh, John Donahue and Daniel uh, Harrington in their commentary on Mark's Gospel. They write this sentence is generally regarded as an addition to Jesus' teaching that was made to address situations related to Roman legal practice, whereby a woman could initiate divorce proceedings. Um. Let's have a look then to see, let's go and talk to our old friend Flavius Josephus to see if he can shed any light on this situation. This is from his Antiquities of the Jews, volume 18. He says, Herodias took it upon herself to confound the laws of her country and divorced her first husband in order to marry Herod Antipas. Now, where was Herod Antipas a tetrarch? He was tetrarch of Galilee, the very place where Jesus was then teaching. So again, we had something that looks like it's a blunder in the Gospels, actually turns out to, uh, to match perfectly. Here's another example. Um, Luke chapter 3, verse 2, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Um, here's um, the objection stated by Robert Taylor. Any person being acquainted with the history and polity of the Jews must have known that there were, never was but one high priest at a time. We have another related issue in John. According to John 11, 49, but one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, wait a minute, wasn't the office of high priest a lifelong occupation? Has John made an error at this point? Well, let's then address the objection. Um, so that, um, that Caiaphas was high priest and high priest throughout the reign of Pontius Pilate, and consequently this time we can find in Cleavage Josephus, Antiquities, Volume 18. Caiaphas had been, was, was made high priest by Valerius Gratus. He was the predecessor of Pontius Pilate, um, and he was removed from his office by Vitellius, president of Syria, after Pilate was sent away out of the province of Judea. The Jews apparently accommodated Roman interference by speaking both of the current Roman appointee and the original ritually appointed Jewish priest as high priests. In fact, Josephus himself uses the same language in, um, for example, in the, in the Jewish war, he writes, and, and both Jonathan and Ananias, the high priests, plural. Now here's the text from Antiquities 18. He says, Gratis gave the high priesthood to Simon, the son of Camathus. He, having enjoyed this honor not above a year, was succeeded by Joseph, who is called Caiaphas. And now we have an explanation for why it mentions Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Um, and then Antiquities, Volume 17, after this Gratis, um, so we, we also read that after after this um, Gratis went away um, for Rome, having been 11 years in Judea, Pontius Pilate was his successor, of the removal of Caiaphas from his office, so Josephus now likewise informs us and connects it with the circumstance, which fixes the time to a date subsequent to the determination of Pilate's government. This is this, the, the text from Antiquities. Vitellius ordered Pilate to repair to Rome, and after that went up himself to Jerusalem, and then gave directions concerning several matters, and having done these things, he took away the priesthood from the high priest Joseph, who was called Caiaphas. So again, what looks on the surface to be a blunder, turns out to be a remarkable evidence for the veracity of the Gospels. Um, if you were making up a Gospel story, um, then the most natural thing to do is to, be, to have one high priest, uh, but the fact that they have two shows an intimate knowledge and familiarity with the political situation of the time. Now I'm going to give a couple of, or a few, uh, a couple of um, bonus undesigned coincidences. I'm going to give one from the Gospels and one from Acts and the Epistles. Uh, remember, an undesigned coincidence, as I discussed last time, I gave a presentation on my webinar, is when you have multiple accounts um, that interlock in a way that's unexpected. If one is copying from the other, or they're both copying from a common source, or the story is being invented. Um, so 
in John chapter 12, we have um, this um, in the first two verses. Um, when Jesus approaches uh, Bethany, um, um, so six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised in the den, so they gave a dinner for him there. So he approaches Bethany, and he has dinner with Lazarus, whom he's raised from the dead, along with Mary and Martha. And then we skim down to verses 12 and 13. We read, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So notice that um, six days before the Passover, he arrives at Bethany, and then he has dinner with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And then the following day, he goes and um, he has a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, let's find those six days in Mark's gospel, the six days referenced in verse one. So let's flip over to the gospel of Mark. Here we have um, Mark chapter 11, and we have the same, uh, we have the parallel version of this in Mark's gospel. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will bring a colt tied on which no one has ever sat on tying and bring it. So obviously in John, remember, he approaches Bethany, he has dinner with Martha and Mary and Lazarus, and then the following day, then he... Um, Sent, gives the disciples the instructions to get the cult. Um, so I'm going to so I'm going to assume that Jesus first came to Bethany the day before, possibly towards the evening, and that this text is um, merely alluding to the fact that Bethany and Bethphage were close to Jerusalem and marked the approach to Jerusalem and the approximate location from which Jesus sent his disciples to get the cult. And so I think that uh, Mark 11 actually telescopes. Um, what was him arriving in the evening and then the morning sending the disciples to go and get the cult. Um, but let's support this assumption from Mark. Um, the event described in Mark 11, in my opinion, seemed to begin very early in the day. Uh, fetching of the donkeys included the triumphal entry. Um, and then Mark says that Jesus entered the temple and looked all around everything in the temple which must have been, it must have taken up an entire day to do all these things, suggesting that he started off early in the, in the day, which is consistent with uh, what we find in John. Now, so let's say that then that um, the triumphal entry is the, it, so we can say that that's five days before the Passover, since we, since we, in our, the start of our chronology, he arrives in Bethany according to John six days before the Passover. So he must be getting the colt and going into the track um, riding into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey five days before the Passover. The close of this day is given in Mark chapter 11, verse 11. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the, into the temple. And when he had looked around it, everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. So that's the close of that day. Then uh, this would therefore be the evening five days before the Passover. Then Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 19 says, on the following day, and then we have um, the cursing of the fig tree. Um, and, and then um, it closes the day at the end in verse 19. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So this is speaking of four days before the Passover. And then the next day we're into three days before the Passover. Mark chapter 11, verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away back to its roots. And then we have the close of that day in Mark 13, verses 1 through 4. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to them, Do you see these, built, these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as, so he's leaving the temple at this point. And then he sits on the Mount of Olives, which is halfway between the temple and Bethany, where he's staying sat on the Mount of Olives, suggesting this is him leaving for the end of the day. Opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when, these, when, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. So here we have the Olivet Discourse in Mark chapter 13. So that's the end then of three days before the Passover. And then what do we read um, in Mark chapter 14? It was now two days before the Passover. And um, so the chronology fits perfectly. 
um, it synchronizes very, very well indeed. And so you've got this undesigned coincidence. John chapter um, um, 12 mentions that it's six days before the Passover. Um, and Mark chapter 14 mentions at just the right time that it's two days before the Passover, at just the time we should expect if indeed um, this, the, the narratives are true. Then let's look at an, um, a bonus undesigned coincidence from, um, from between Acts and the epistles of Paul. This one's from 1 Thessalonians 3. It says, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one may be moved by these afflictions. For you as yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. We were willing to be left behind at Athens alone and we sent Timothy. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Now from 1 Thessalonians 3 verses 1 through 6, a section I just read then, it appears that Paul was alone at Athens, having sent Timothy to Thessalonica, and that Timothy joined him afterwards. And when we read Acts 17 verse 14 and following, this agrees with this, except that instead of, of being sent to Thessalonica, Timothy was left at Berea. Here's what we read in Acts 17. But when the Jews from, so, and Paul has been in Thessalonica, then he goes to Berea. Um, and uh, remember, the Bereans are said to be noble because they didn't trust Paul. It went back and studied the scriptures to see if everything that he was saying was true. And then it says, but when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Um, so Berea is less than 50 miles west of Thessalonica. Paul left Berea for Athens in haste because the Jews from Thessalonica came to Berea to stir up the people against him. So under the circumstances, Paul was worried about the Christians in Thessalonica. So he therefore commissioned Timothy to go back to Thessalonica to check on the church there. Um, now Luke in the book of Acts, just he, he completely omits um, the sending of Paul for, uh, sorry, the sending of Timothy from Berea to Thessalonica. So he thus leaves the, the cause of his separation from Paul unexplained. Why is Timothy left in Berea? Well, Acts doesn't tell us. But First Thessalonians illuminates it for us indicating that he was left at Berea in order that he could go back to Thessalonica to check on the Christians in Thessalonica. So in conclusion then, numerous lines of evidence converge to support the conclusion that the gospel accounts concerning Jesus' life and indeed the history of the early church given in Acts are substantially reliable and that they are based on credible eyewitness testimony. Um, and um, for more, um, I would recommend going back to watching my in my presentation I did for Apologetics Academy on undesigned coincidences and also to Dr. Timothy McGrew's uh, presentation that he did on the veracity of the book of Acts. So I'll close there and um, I'll just give some further reading. Um, I recommend the uh, book of Acts and the setting of Hellenistic history by John Hammer. I recommend Richard Balcom, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. I recommend Dr. Lydia McGrew, Hidden in Plain View, Undesigned Coincidences in the Gospels and Acts, a must-read book. Um, Jesus Under Fire is another good book. Um, this one by Craig Bloomberg, The Historical Reliability of the New Testament, responds to a lot of the major objections. Um, also a popular level book um, by Lee Strobel, The Case for the Real Jesus. Um, and finally, uh, this is uh, I'll take some questions now. So this is the um, interactive portion of the program. If anyone would like to interact or ask questions, I'll be very happy to um, engage. Um, you can uh, raise hand or um, submit it um, um, by intellectual form. 